man. Does that spill the whole can on? At least not on the door. Especially since I Then. 
And I meant I spent almost every hour of the day <laughs> typing in passwords to install software for people to allow security things, which then also meant that I had to put off the installation rolling out of Mojave because I don't really want to spend all my day at anything through the security side. And of course, no MDL with that. So the current environment I've got now is so I've got a Mac Mini that's got a local repo of Monkey on it. And on top of that, I've got Auto Packager actually running the jobs nightly and running the recipes. And then when I get in in the mornings, I'll then sync that up to a bucket in Google Cloud um, and then kind of run it on my test VM and then run it on actual laptops with the software updates and then I'll put them through into our production repo and sync them up. And this is what the environment I'm working on at the moment is, which is running auto package in Circle CI, which is something that I kind of picked up on after Graham Gilbert did the talk at Mac App UK about, um, which kind of from my testing it takes the majority of the manual side of things away. Uh, but yeah, so why? You don't have any on site infrastructure, you don't have that Mac Mini in your server closet that kind of just gets abandoned and yeah. It's hard to make mistakes because everything's done through Git, everything's version control, um, everything will be done through a, a pull request on a Git repo. So if you do mess something up, then it's like one or two clicks to then put everything back again. And how am I going to go about doing this? Well, Facebook's team have helpfully written up auto package tools, um, and you basically tell it where the plist is what the name of the Git repo is, and then you just run it in your CI CD tool. Uh, and then Rick Hills helpfully made some modifications to that, um, which kind of did the actual pushing up to the Git repo side of it. Um, there's not a great deal of CI tools there that support uh, Mac OS VMs without you having to host them. The one that we're using is Circle CI, which is helpfully the one that our dev team already used. Um, and yeah, thanks to Graham Gilbert for doing his talk at Mac Ad, which is where I actually found about it in the first place. Um, and like, what issues have I encountered when I've been testing this? Something I had with Git is because each time it makes a, or downloads a new piece of software, it makes a branch on the Git repo for it. Now I was like, what, why isn't the script picking up that there's kind of any new branches and that this has already been around? And what I didn't think is that whilst it's in the kind of origin on GitHub servers, without manually going and tracking every single git branch or running it with a flag. The command line tools doesn't have a clue that it's there. So then once you've cloned the git repo down, you have to then run a script to manually track every single um, branch that you've got out there. Otherwise it tries to update and GitHub says no. Yeah, and this is a fancy animation of what I want my environment to look like. Circle so CI will run nightly on a schedule and it'll run clone down all the repos and all the dependencies um, and then run auto pack tools that uh, Facebook's team made and then once it picks up for example Google Chrome will update um, it pull that down and make a branch on the Git repo and then push that up and then we'll do that for every single recipe that you've got and then once I then push that up to monkey repo and make a branch on there um, and then when I actually merge it into master on there, it will then push that up to my Google bucket that all of my Macs are actually looking at. Um, and yeah, that's the end. Any questions? I don't know how clear that was. I didn't really have a plan of us writing this out. So <laughs> yeah, we thought we were all over the place. issues have you had? No, no, just we can't get the uh, funding past the board. Oh, yeah, yeah, because yeah, like, all the Macs are getting broken, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
but in, uh, in some conversations on the Mac Admins Slack channel, um, I seemed to be able to get this where uh, a couple of other people didn't, so I thought, well, that's, that's something I could, I could talk about. Uh, and kind of what I want to do tonight is, is give a really practical guide into um, how you might get started doing stuff with regex if you've not done it before or if you've seen things like this and you're just uh, really scared by it. Um, so I'm not an expert, we're not going to be going uh, very advanced at all, and uh, if this is all stuff you know about already, then I'm sorry. Uh, right, so regex, uh, what's it good for? Um, well, it's, if you don't know anything about it at all, it's about matching patterns in text strings. Um, why do we need that? Um, well, I've got three kids. And when my oldest was very small, he called all animals dog. No matter what it was, he pointed it, say dog. And it's you know for adults we kind of find it pretty easy. I mean, you look at these pictures here. I've chosen some pictures of animals which kind of look like dogs, but hopefully you can spot that three of them aren't dogs. But children have to learn that skill. Um, if you think about it, it's actually quite difficult. If you had to explain to somebody, pick one of those pictures up there, and you had to explain why it's not a dog, trying to kind of put those features down into words and then say what it is that makes it not a dog is actually pretty difficult. And it's similar if you want a computer to look for a pattern in text, then uh, it's actually quite difficult to explain what it is that makes that pattern the thing we're looking for. So imagine if, um, if somebody hands you a business card, uh, you, can, you can work out pretty easily which is their phone number, which is their email address, which is their postal address. But trying to get a computer to do that is, is a bit tricky. A computer doesn't uh, inherently recognize an email address. And so when we, um, when we use regular expressions to, to kind of set up these, these pattern matches, we need to think about the edge cases. We need to think about the things that uh, separate a match from not a match. Um, so I, I want to sort of talk through how I would go about doing that uh, using a couple of practical scenarios. Uh, so the first one here is one that uh, came up on the Mac Admins <coughs> Slack. I don't know if Toby's here tonight. Give us a wave, Toby, if you are. No idea what Toby looks like. So, yeah. um, anyway, Toby was asking about a, uh, using a regex to uh, find uh, software to compare software version numbers. So you're looking for um, software is all on your Mac that matches or exceeds a given version number. And we're all pretty familiar with uh, format of version numbers, um, but trying to kind of get a computer to assess them is difficult because the number of groups uh, in that version number might change, and the number of digits within each group might change. And so it's not a, a simple case of just doing maths and saying is number A bigger than number B. Uh, now, you could do it with a script. You could um, split the version number into groups and then look at each group and compare it against your target. And we've probably done that, most of us, with scripts uh, looking at Mac OS versions. That's fairly common. Um, but you'd need to then uh, store the outcome somewhere and uh, decide what to do with it. And obviously, if it includes letters as well, then all your maths falls down. Uh, now the other thing you can do is uh, to do a, a sort of strict comparison. So you can say, um, okay, uh, I've got version 4.9.0.504. Um, I'm going to deploy it to all machines which have a version that's different from that. So just is it exactly 4.9.0.504 or not? And uh, I've done it on all my Jamf certifications uh, this year, and that's kind of what we did on the Jamf courses. And it's great if you've only got like maybe two or three versions in your database. Uh, but in the real world, certainly in our real world, I guess pretty messy. Uh, so we're gonna use regex. And um, when I'm writing on regex, I like to start with the most simple edge case and build it up from there. So we're gonna start by trying to match that version number exactly. Um, and regex is looking for a string. Uh, so uh, we, we can just put the version number into a string. Except that uh, there's a problem with that because uh, a period, a full stop, in regex is a special character, so we just need to escape that. Um, but the trouble is it would also match uh, this version number, where the one we want is contained in the middle. 
And this uh, other version number is actually lower than the one we want. So that's going to cause us, uh, it gives us a false result. Uh, the carrot, the little hat at the start there, and the dollar symbol at the end. Uh, carrot at the start means search for the string at the uh, right at the start of the, uh, the target string. And then dollar means the same thing at the end. So if we have the carrot and the dollar, then we're saying search for the string with nothing before it and nothing after it. Uh, so that's pretty good. Um, but actually, for version numbers, we don't care if there's anything at the end, because that's, it's only going to be a higher version if it's got anything after it. So we can just leave off the dollar and just have the carrot. So that's, that's a good regex. If we want to search for a particular version number, we can, uh, can use that regex there. Um, but we are actually looking for um, any computers which have a version number or higher already installed. Because if they've already got something higher than this version, they don't need this version installing. So we want to think about what happens if the version number is increasing. And again, we'll start symbol and we'll build it up. So we start by changing the last digit. And uh, if the last uh, digit changes, it's uh, four at the moment, it's going to go up, and it's going to go up as far as nine. Any more than nine, and you've got more than one digit changing. And uh, regex allows us to uh, specify alternative characters at a single location. Do this, we'll put them in square brackets there. So this regex says uh, 490 and then 50 and anything from 4 to 9. Uh, that's good, but it's a bit long winded. Uh, there's a, a simpler syntax which lets us specify a range there. So we can say instead of uh, listing them all out, just a range 4 to 9. Uh, so that's good. So that's covered just one digit to change. And again, we keep moving on. So if we've got two digits changing now, uh, well, once we've got up to nine, that's going to tick over back to zero, and the digit before it is going to go from a zero to a one. And then that's going to keep going up. So we can do the same thing we did last time. We've got the range uh, one to nine in the next last digit, and then zero to nine in the last digit. So this is for two digits changing. Uh, and we do need to include that last digit. We can't just have uh, the 5 and then the 1 to 9, because that would match against the two digit number, like 51, which would be lower than the 504 we started with. Um, OK, so that's good. But that last digit there, um, we are a it could be any digit from 0 to 9, and so there's a slightly simpler way of writing it. Instead of writing out the full range, we can use the backslash D as a shorthand for any digit. Uh, so there we go. So now we've got, uh, we've got two alternatives. For uh, the one digit change, we've got 5, 0, and then 4 to 9. And for two digit change, we've got 1 to 9, and then any digit at the end. Uh, and we could run those two regexes separately. We could, we could search against one, if it doesn't match that, search against the other. But obviously that's going to get pretty long-winded. So we want to try and include them in a single uh, expression. And regex allows us to include alternatives in a single expression using the pipe symbol. This is where it starts to, to look a little bit complicated. But it's, uh, it's, uh, it's just the same thing, it's just uh, the two alternatives there with the pipe. And uh, we wrap the, the two alternatives in uh, parentheses there, uh, so that we don't need to repeat the sections that haven't changed. Um, now, it can, uh, a few people commenting on, on Slack, it can seem a bit uh, kind of uh, unwieldy and a bit unsatisfactory to have um, two alternatives here when all you're doing is incrementing a number. That's because you have to remember, um, regex isn't doing maths, it's comparing strings. It doesn't know that these two strings are numbers. It doesn't really care. It's just looking at string formats. So we need to put in the hard work to uh, determine what that's going to look like. OK, so we keep going. And, and now we've got up to um, uh, 400, uh, sorry, 599. And now we've uh, taken over to cover changes in the last three digits. And so beyond um, 599, we're looking for any three-digit number starting with a 6 or greater. And we do the same sort of thing again, so we've got uh, another alternative tacked on the end there. Um, and it's three-digit number, six, uh, starting with a 6 to a 9, and then followed by two digits. 
Uh, now, instead of repeating that uh, slash D character for the two digits at the end, again, we can simplify the syntax there uh, by saying we want a digit twice, and we do that by a number in curly braces. Uh, so now we have a regex that will cover us from 490504 all the way up to 490999. But of course, software developers don't always kind of follow the rules when they uh, release software versions. And so there's no reason that the, uh, this software might stop at version 999, it might tick over to 1000. And we want to make sure we cover that as well. Uh, so again, uh, we can add a, uh, another alternative in there uh, for a digit, a four digit number. So that's slash D and then um, code braces with a four inside. But again, software developers don't play by the rules. What if they want to go really mad and issue software uh, release version number 490-10,000 or 100,000 or 10 million or whatever? It's unlikely. But if we're going to the trouble of writing a regex, we want to make sure we're covering all those possibilities. And uh, so instead of just sort of specifying a single number there in the curly braces, we can set a range. And a range is defined by a maximum and a minimum separated by a comma. And we can even leave out uh, one of those two, and the range will just expand as far as possible. So here we've got four, comma, and then blank. And that just says, I want at least four digits. Um, up to as many as you like, really. Uh, so there we have a regex. Uh, so it's starting to look a bit complicated, but it's, it's not too bad. Um, that will do 490, um, and then whatever number we like that's 504 or greater at the end. Uh, now, I mentioned those ranges uh, with the curly braces and the numbers. There's a couple of um, shortcuts here that we can use. Uh, that you'll see quite commonly. So question mark means zero or one of the preceding character or character type. Asterisk means zero or more. And then a plus means one or more. And uh, basically, we just use that logic uh, following through. Think about how each number can change. The, um, the preceding groups are a bit easier because there's only one digit there to start with. Um, uh, but it, it does end up with a bit of a sort of spaghetti mess. It's, I, I find it pretty tricky to kind of decode these things that somebody else has written. Um, but if I write it myself, building up like that sequentially, it's, it's not too bad. Okay, so that's, that's version numbers. Um, another scenario where I've had to use regexes recently is in uh, passing log files. Uh, this is another real world problem. Um, I had a log file from some backup software and I needed to be able to extract data from it. So this is a, uh, a little snapshot of the, um, the log file there and it's written in XML. And I was looking for two things. Uh, first of all is the um, backup set ID, which I put there as an X. And that's a number. I can look at the backup files for a couple of cases. I can see it's a number. I don't know how many digits it's going to be. And then the other thing I want is the name, uh, which is with the Y's there. And that can be pretty much anything. It's, um, it's based on the name of the Mac, so kind of letters, numbers, uh, hyphens, a few other things. Um, and the trick is, I don't know how many of these backup sets that are going to be listed in the log file. So um, regex is a great tool for this. It'll search the log file, find all the matches, and give me the data I want. So let's, let's uh, start simple again and build it up. So I'm uh, just looking for the ID there. Um, start off with this, uh, this regex. And the start there, I've got the, the carrot again saying, hey, start from the start of the line. I'm looking for uh, some spaces. This is uh, XML, it's uh, been prettified, it's indented. So I know there's um, possibly a space at the start. I don't know how many spaces there might be. And then we've got this uh, XML tag opening up backup sets and an ID, and then uh, the ID is it's, it's numeric, so it's got some digits in it. That's that. And then just extending that a bit further, that's going to be followed by um, some more white space, which uh, uh, can include new lines, and usually does in this case. 
and then some name tags and some stuff in the middle there. And the stuff in the middle, um, we can use the, the period special character that matches any character at all except a new line. So um, it's going to go as far possibly as the end of the line. It's not going to go any further than that, which is good because I don't want it matching the whole document by accident. Uh, and then it's followed by a closing XML tag. Now that's got a slash in it, obviously, and that needs to be back there. It needs to be escaped with a backslash in regex. So that's good. So this regex here will look for those lines that I was interested in with the ID uh, number and the name of my backup set. Um, the trouble is it's got a whole bunch of other junk in there as well that, that I already know what it says because I've, I've written the regex around it, but I'm not really interested in it. What I really want to do is just find the data that I'm uh, interested in. And uh, regex lets us do that as well. Um, and we can do it by using parentheses again to define capture groups. So we use them previously for alternatives, um, but we can use them to say, you know, I'm really interested in this specific bit of, uh, bit of the string. Uh, so uh, what have we got here? Uh, there's our, yeah, that's just highlighting all the, um, all the extra stuff I don't really care about. And then what we do is we put parentheses around the bits that I'm actually interested in. So first of all, the ID number, and second of all, the name. And now that's pretty good, um, but obviously if you've got several of these in a string, that gets pretty confusing. And uh, one thing you can do to make it a bit simpler is to name these groups. So you can, you can use within rejects, you can give each group a name, and then you can refer to those names in your results, um, which really helps. Uh, so there's, there's a few different ways of doing that. Um, this is the syntax I find easiest to use, uh, which is uh, within the parentheses there, you've got a question mark, capital P, and then some angle brackets with the name for that capture group. Uh, yep, that's pretty, that's pretty much the, the regex I came up with. Uh, now I'll show you in a minute kind of just how I put that into practice. but. Um, before I do, I thought I'd mention a couple of tools that are really helpful if you're uh, trying to use regexes or learn them. Uh, the first one is the web set, because every time we build a regex is really, um, lets you uh, put a string in and test it, and um, basically shows you where you've made mistakes as well. So a few different things. So up at the top here, there's a little box to put your string into. Uh, down the bottom, um, and this, this really helps, write a bunch of test strings. So you're looking for those edge cases. You're trying to find strings that uh, are as weird as you can think of that will still match and then are close to them but won't match. And then you make sure that your regex really does match the ones you want and doesn't match the ones you don't want. Uh, and up at the top right, um, uh, top right there we've got, um, it gives you an explanation of what your regex string is looking for. So you can, uh, you can see if it's really doing what you thought it was doing and then down the bottom um, as a, a reference, so you don't need to remember all these special characters that will tell you what they are. Um, the, uh, so that's pretty good. Uh, the next side is if you're really getting into regex and you like nerdy word puzzles, which <laughs> does pretty much cover me, um, this really, I'm going to say it's really cool, uh, regex crossword lets you do crosswords with regexes. How awesome is that? <laughs> Um, no, it, it really is fun, it's great. <laughs> uh, okay, so how, um, I mean that's kind of coming up with regex is, how do you actually use these? Well, the first way is, uh, since we're here hosted by Jam, I figured I'd have to talk about Jam. Um, the inversion numbers, uh, you can actually use them in uh, Jam smart group uh, definitions. Uh, it'll let you put it straight in there, you don't need to use script or anything, it's just one of the options. And I think this is, the best way to search for uh, ranges of version numbers uh, in Java. So that's really easy to use. Um, if you're doing more kind of complex stuff using the strings and so on, uh, you might want to do it in Python. And Python's got uh, really good support for regexes um, and uh, it uses this RE module. Uh, and it's got a bunch of functions that we can use to match regexes. Um, the simplest one is just called match, which is uh, fairly obvious. 
And uh, so I've got an example of there using the regex I showed earlier to match against the, uh, the applock string. Um, and then refer to those results groups by names. Remember, I called them, uh, what we call them, ID cap and name cap. And then you can just output them uh, by name, which works really well. Uh, now, obviously, um, uh, Python's uh, not included in macOS anymore, or not going to be. Um, uh, and both Bash and uh, Z Shell support uh, regexes, but you know, we don't really talk about Bash anymore, so I'm just going to talk about Z Shell. Uh, uh, there are various ways to make use of regexes in Z Shell. Uh, the most straightforward is uh, just using this regex match operator, which is a, an equal sign followed by a squiggle. You can use that in an if statement. Now, if, uh, like me, you Google uh, for uh, Z Shell and regex, you might be really excited to discover that it can support uh, full regexes. And what I should say, if we go back to um, regex 101 here, you see up at the top left, there's a few different kind of flavors of regex. Um, there's slight variation <coughs> between them. Uh, the one I'm talking about is called PCRE. Um, I think JavaScript is slightly different. Uh, but yeah, if you Google, uh, if you Google, you discover that Z Shell can support PCRE regex. And so this is brilliant. I could just kind of port that stuff, uh, stuff from Python straight into Z Shell. However, Z Shell on Mac OS doesn't include the PCRE module, um, which is really annoying. Obviously, you could install it, but that means doing it all uh, across your feed. What Z Shell does support is something called POSIX regex, which is a bit like PCRE regex, but it's a bit different, uh, just annoyingly. Um, main differences being that the uh, slash character classes, so we had a slash s for some white space earlier, slash d for a digit, and uh, you can have slash w for any word character. Uh, they're not supported in POSIX regex. And instead we have to uh, define, we have specify classes using um, slightly different syntax with square brackets, colon, digit, colon, square brackets, which you might have seen in things like uh, awk, and uh, said and so on. And then you have to put that inside another set of square brackets to indicate alternatives. So that's a, a bit annoying. Um, but if you use this uh, match operator, then the main result, so the, the whole regex string you were searching for, is returned as dollar block capitals match. And then if you put in the subgroups, they come back as a, an array of uh, lowercase match. Uh, one thing to watch out for that might catch you out if you're new to Z Shell is that by default uh, arrays on Z Shell start indexing at one, not at zero. So don't get, don't do that, and then work out. You wonder why the, um, match zero isn't returning anything. It's because it starts a match one. Uh, but there you go. Um, yeah, I've done most of those recently. I find it quite useful. It's not as scary as you think, I think, maybe. Okay, so looked at methodology, um, looked at the position anchors, the carrot and the dollar, um, alternatives to square brackets, the classes with the backslashes, quantifiers, groups. <coughs> yeah, any questions? <laughs> ben. <laughs> You can do POSIX regex in um, regex 101, but you can't filter for it. So it won't tell you when 
your regex will fail on Z shell, which is really annoying. But it is brilliant, uh, apart from that. And there isn't anything better. You mentioned that you've not been doing this for very long, because you were doing patents. Uh, yeah, five years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I'm quite impressed. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, another bit, I, I read the other day that BB Edit is now supporting some sort of live regex preview. Have you had a chance to look at that? Um, I haven't. I did see that as well. <laughs> in version 13, I think, is it? Yeah. Um, yes, so it's, uh, I think it's using regexes to search within text documents rather than helping you develop regexes, but yeah, it's all good. Yes, no? Right, great. I've survived my first London <laughs>
Um, could you please sit your ass down? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> ready? Ready, go for it. Good. Do we have everybody's attention? Good evening, everyone. I'm sitting down because, unfortunately, I'm on the tail end of a cold I picked up on Monday, and I'm not really feeling 100%. Which means this is now the second Jamf event I've been to where I've been ill. That includes Jamf 2017 where somehow I did a talk on smart cards and don't remember a bloody time. No, no, <laughs> so, to begin with, this is not the tech story you might think it is. Um, when I told Neil the title it was Achieving Your Goals with Technology, what I really should have said is Achieving my goals with technology, but as a way to motivate everybody else into doing what they need to do. So this one's more of a, a personal story than anything else. Um, some of you know who I am. Um, you'll find me on the Mac Admin Slack as Franti. Uh, you'll occasionally find me post on Jack Nation under the same name. Uh, I have a blog on that website directly behind me, um, which I don't update that much anymore for reasons that will become apparent fairly soon. <coughs> Excuse me, coughing like crazy. Uh, at least this time I didn't deafen the audience like I did at January 2017. So, <coughs> if you want to know more about sort of motivation and my own personal motivation, it's kind of handy to know a bit more about me and probably a bit more depth than most people would expect to know. So, that up there is actually my original hometown of Killingworth, circa, circa the 1980s. Um, if you think that looks like a depressing hovel, you'd be absolutely right. Um, the best bit is that, doesn't, that entire building complex doesn't exist anymore because thanks to uh, a combination of uh, bad tenants, low income, political corruption and a corrupt developer skimping on the concrete makes the whole thing was starting to fall to bits and got demolished in the early 1990s. But that is basically the area that I grew up in. And my chances at that point from were either become a hardcore heroin addict, uh, turn to serious amounts of crime, or find some way to get the hell out of there. Um, and this next slide describes pretty much what it was like. So this is a wonderful little app I've got on the iPhone called WT Forecast. And one day I turned it on and it got the geolocation wrong and thought I was in the seventh circle of hell. <laughs> yeah. um, with the appropriate weather conditions to go with it. I love this app. <laughs> but it's a case of, <coughs> I'm now here talking to you guys right now. How do I go from that? And where do I want to go from here? Well, um, the background to this is the guy who made it got this in through Oscar qualifying film festivals and he got it into the top 10 of uh, short films on that year and then missed out on the Oscar list by one because they take the top five and his was number six. Whoops. That kind of sucks worse than actually getting on the list and uh, not, not getting there. But it's a case of how do I go from an, an area of poverty to to that, basically. Um, and that starts with this film here. Who remembers War Games? Cool. Um, anyone who's ever watched War Games will know that the best way to hack the US Department of Defense is an, is an 8080 up there uh, and an acoustic coupler. And uh, a little voice box that goes, greetings, Professor Falcon. But this is the film that <coughs> because it was made in 83, I was four years old at that point, a bit young. Um, but this is the thing that basically gave me my clue as to what I wanted to do with life. And it actually gave, my, gave me my um, inspiration, excuse me, in a couple of different ways. Because I wanted to get into the film industry, but I realized that because I was already getting quite a bit of technology back then, that that tech might prove, might be the route to do it. Um, the problem is, is that uh, on the way you encounter things like this. Um, 
that was a real live server cupboard, which has thankfully since been ripped out. It's possibly one of the worst things I've ever seen. I've got pictures of uh, the kit. <laughs> Uh, the question was, was that Wimbledon? And the answer is yes. In fact, that was the, this was the actual picture that was responsible for this uh, cupboard being ripped out and the entire uh, building being rekindled. <coughs> Excuse me. So, you know, now we've got, your actual, we've got the actual plan. Know what we want to do. How are we going to do it? Well, what I ended up doing was I ended up taking a segue into a lot of different IT jobs. And these IT jobs then basically provided the financial backing to do what I really wanted to do. And the first thing that came out was this. Uh, my old Mac Pro 1.1. That was the day it arrived. Got the cinema display, got the, got the big box that weighed a ton. Um, and you know, back then in 2006, this was, you know, this, this was hot. Not many people had these. I used to tell Windows owners that this thing had uh, two dual core processors in, and you'd see that mouse drop. Now we don't even blink when we've got eight core laptops. But again, this point is about learning the technology. And learning the technology also meant learning things like editing packages. Now, I know some of you have worked in the creative industry uh, in various different forms. Who remembers Final Cut Studio? Who remembers swapping disks for Final Cut Studio? There's a lesson that you never forget. But spending the time, spending the time getting good at the IT jobs to make sure, you know, to make sure that you kept getting the IT jobs and keep the money coming, keep the money coming in, because my motivation was always film. It was never about the IT. The IT was always there, which meant that I could do things like this. So that was actually a scene from the film that I wrote and shot in 2007. And that has provided a sort of bigger boost to my own personal dreams and aspirations than anything else, but I couldn't have done it without working in the IT industry. Um, that also provided the ability to do things like this in 2012. Yes, I have been around some of the big uh, Hollywood talent agencies. Um, but it's not all been work, work, work. Um, if you're not a fan of bad language, I apologise for the next slide. Uh, I've also had the ability to sort of travel around the place. Um, this is a wonderful little village in Austria. <laughs> um, as far as I'm concerned, this is the, also the home of the funniest Wikipedia page I've ever found. Um, just because the, the, the puns on it are just far too good to miss. Um, I'll tell you right now that this village is eight houses and there's nothing there and they are really, really unhappy that British tourists find the place so funny. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> but, because of getting around and doing this kind of stuff, I get to meet people like yourself. And infamously at Macaduck, I remember suggesting to Ben over there, who's not paying attention. <laughs> Excellent. We like it when you get told of them. It keeps you sensible. Anyway, so on the lead up to Macaduck, if you remember Ben, you know, we had a discussion that, you know, it was Rich Trout's birthday. Now, who here has used the De and the Bog and anything that Rich Trout has used? Uh, the answer is quite a lot of you, because Rich is a really, really cool guy. But we realized at the second Macaduck that uh, it was Rich Trout's birthday. So, by organizing on the Mac admin Slack and finding that, hey, I've got this great idea, maybe we should organize something for Rich, and Ben saying, yeah, that's a good idea, why don't you organize it? <laughs> we took most of Macaduck out to uh, a Mexican place, and the owner couldn't believe what he was hearing and says, oh, how many people do you need to book a table for? And I said, 28 people, and then 32 of us turned up. And then, just to make life even more awesome, because he's not here right now, David Ackland paid the entire bill without prompting. And that was pretty awesome. 
But the basic point is, is that I have a long-term goal. There were some incidental things all along the way, um, but I never forgot what my long-term goal was, but I used the technology and the things that we all do in this room every single day to, achieve, to hopefully achieve what I want to achieve out of life. Which basically means, as of a week and a half ago, I got my US visa. I got the hardest of the hard. If you know what the EB1 visa is, then you know what a big deal this is. Because there's a lot of stuff that I've left out on the way. And like I say, technology and working in tech and being reasonably good at tech, I'd like to hope, um, is what made it possible. So the question is, is the future going to be this? And the answer is, I don't know, but it's going to be fun finding out. Alternatively, I could get sucked back into tech again. I think, but yeah, who knows? So the basic thing is, is that having a long-term goal, having a long-term goal for your life is what makes you happy in the end. And if sometimes it's all about finding that what that goal is. If you know, if you want to climb Everest, find a way to do it. If you just want to, you know put jigsaws together, find a way to do it. There's nothing wrong with either of these things. You know, you've got to do what's right for you. Because living to work is infinitely worse than working to live. So you've got to do whatever it comes to achieve it. And sometimes the path will be hard and it'll be rocky, but it'll be worth it. Plans have got to be flexible. I have chopped and changed things that I've done more times than I can count. When I went for the funding for the film Mayfly, which by the way is on YouTube and you can search it out if you want. Um, you know, we got knocked back more times than I can count. The answer was no, we did it anyway. The only difference was instead of using public generated funding for it, I used my own finance. This had its own disadvantages where I found myself blacklisted because of it because the people who said no suddenly looked very, very stupid. Hence the reason I'm going to the US. But yeah, you can't do all of this stuff on your own. This is why we have a community. This is why you guys are all here. And that's the real important part. We help each other out, we will all get further. This is not about you know, self-aggrandizing. It's not about doing yourself up at the cost of everybody else. You help me, I help you. And we all come out better for it. And the last one, which is about regrets, is someone who was a member of my family had the chance to do something when they were younger and turned it down. And they turned that down at age 18 and they have regretted it every day of their lives since. I don't want to go to the end of my days with that kind of regret. If I fail, so be it. At least I will have tried. And that applies to most things in life. It applies to your jobs, it applies to your careers, it applies to your personal life, it applies to everything. At least have the attempt, have the courage of your conviction to try and do it. Because at the end of the day, you can't go through life without some form of regret, but you can minimize what you've got. And with all that in mind, the message was this so long and thanks for all the fish. <laughs> and thank you very much. Any questions for Richard? For the past? What stage? That was a bit hard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, they've had enough of me, it's fine. <laughs> right. There's one thing I'm going to say before I start talking. Darren, right. hoodie off. <laughs> Get it off. Not all stuff. Fortunate wardrobe choices, part two. Um, hello, good evening, hello. Okay, so, we've got a lot of great talks tonight, but um, I have a feeling that you don't want this one. So, this is over and done with and then go somewhere else. Yeah? Okay, cool. Right. So, New Year, who did? 
this. This is a horrible title that we'll potentially revisit every year. But uh, the last time we met, we were looking at WWEC, all the things that happened, all the great new stuff that happened to the new Apple device, and the shiny things that we really like. So there we go, you know, your watch OS, your iOS, your Mac OS, your TV OS. Great, we're gonna look at this as an app, and look at this from an app point of view. Now, watchOS and tvOS, they're great and all that, but from an administrative point of view, from us as admins, there's not a lot that we have to worry about this year, potentially. They're generally as they are, unless you have an older watch OS and you can't get the newer one, the older version of watch. I mean, I'm, I'm still looking at Series Zero, so I am, I, I am way behind, but I know there's some folks on the London channel who are bemoaning the, the lay of it going across, and unfortunately they're not here now because they're stuck up north, which is really nice for me to try and wind them up vaguely about that now. Um, so we're going to ignore those. And um, we're going to look at iOS and macOS. But from, you know, from what we saw at WWDC, this became iOS, macOS, iPadOS. There was a split here. And regarding these three new OSs, uh, or these three OSs, what was the impact to us as an admin? Again, very much short, time, short, short window here, talk about the impact to us as an admin. This is the kind of stuff that we should be looking at. The first thing is user enrollment. Now, user enrollment uh, is a thing where people can enroll their BYOD devices into an MDM, and the MDM manages that part that they deploy. Some of the others have this for a while. Um, AirWatch had a feature around BYOD where you can enroll and choose what settings you can manage what you couldn't. So you could set it so you could only remove and re-add what you'd deployed. Jamf had their own personal device enrollment. Apple have now made it a proper feature within the MDM spec. Mm -hmm. uh, as Matt said earlier, it's not available as of yet currently within Jamf fully. It's coming. Um, although, if you saw the email from Jamf earlier today on the train in, as I did, because uh, I come up in Zone 7, and Stuart, there is a Zone 7, um, then <laughs> um, Jamf. Jamf 1016, which is the release today, is the last release before Jamf, so I expect to be released after Jamf, where Jamf fully release, fully support user enrollment. Other MDMs do support this, potentially at the moment, users manage up by these, but the idea is a BYD user enrolls, and the MDM manages that part of the OS that they deploy to. So you deploy an app to that device, you can manage that app. You deploy an email account to that device, you, you manage that email account. You can't, you can't manage the, 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 customer's, the end user's personal device, personal email address. And so when a device enrolls, and rolls, uh, and rolls, then that stuff's removed. So it's a nice BYOD workflow, but Apple have formalized this now, which is really cool. And for iOS, I mean, iOS itself, that's kind of the last major, major bit. There's a lot of other stuff coming in, but really, for iOS, the big kind of alerting thing that we have to worry about as admins, that's probably it. The rest of it's kind of evolutionary. So we went from five to three to two. See? Getting at the end pretty quick, right? You know? <laughs> um, so, <laughs> if we look at macOS and uh, iPadOS, what happened here was uh, a thing called Marzipan, back in, back in the day, back in the day as in like summer, um, is now called Catalyst, where you can develop apps on your iPad and make them work on your macOS and vice versa. Things like the uh, news app, was it Notes as well? Yeah, um, but those sort of things where you can build them with your next code and they should work across. That's going to be really quite cool going forward. There should be a lot of those type of apps that, go, that, that should work. And then we've got some apps internally that we have different builds of that would be really nice to unify because it makes no sense for them to be separate. So that's a nice new feature. The next thing that's going to come across uh, for us admins is potentially is Safari. So Safari on iPadOS is deemed a desktop browser experience. If you have some kind of compliance requirements, a thing around Octoduo or whatever, that has a particular version of Safari running on a particular OS, you could come across here because iPadOS is going to look at look like the, the desktop OS version of Safari. So that's, that's one thing to be mindful of, and especially if you've got WebOS or if you've got some like, um, sorry, not WebOS, so that's, that goes back a while. Um, the folks from HP probably know what I'm talking about. Um, but if you're managing like, websites and doing reactive stuff around the user agent stream, that can probably affect you as well. So let's forget about iPadOS. I mean, a lot of the stuff there is generally what follows from iOS 13, apart from those couple of things we mentioned. Um, and again, this was, this was purposely a very short talk because I know the pubs afterwards. Um, so let's look at macOS. So the first thing with macOS, I mean, Mac kind of ruined this, um, but I make it look snicker. Um, <laughs> was the notifications. 
Now, notifications, it's user approved notifications. Now, the Halo, Bundle ID, and all that stuff comes from iOS. If you manage iOS devices, it was exclusive, which meant that you could have one profile to manage all of your preferences for your, for your notifications. Um, Apple changed that recently with Beta 8 or something within Catalina. Catalina got to Beta 11 the Friday before it was released, or GM, depends on which seed you're looking at, which was really nice for something to be released on Friday as a, as a GM and then suddenly, oh, public release on the Monday. That was not a surprise. Thanks. Um, so, but the notifications here, this is where us as admins need to decide what we need to worry about. Do we want, there's certain tools you're using, you're using Tunnel Notify still, uh, if you're using Monkey, if you're using Jamps, Manual Actions, all your other agents, whatever you have, they might well install a profile to approve these automatically. But for Slack, if you're deploying Slack as an organization, do you really want to force a choice on people around approving if all notifications are, are enabled or not? That's a difficult question. And now people are going to be faced with all these prompts and nags, prompts and nags, prompts and nags, which is, you know, welcome to the modern macOS management. Um, none of those, we have the new, or the, well, not the new, with the privacy privacy policy control payments as we had before, um, except they've extended this. So if a thing needs to access your desktops and documents, you'll get prompts. So again, if it's in context, if someone opens up an application like a hippie on Slack, like someone opens up Slack and wants to save a file, and it says, will you allow Slack access to your downloads? And that kind of makes sense if it's in context. But if you're running some scripts in the background that needs to really use a home folder, there might be these weird prompts that appear. You might need to be mindful around this. The other thing being as well that the main change other than user home is also SMB file shares. So, or, or not SMB file shares, but generally file shares. So, if you're using a thing like Jamf and you're using file shares and not HTTP, HTTPS, then you're going to get nags about allowing this external volume to install stuff on your local volume. So, be mindful of that. It needs to be employed from an MDM. The solution that no, apologies, it doesn't need to be employed from a user approved anything, I don't think, currently. You might make it over this monkey or something, but double check that these are the types of prompts that you might, might see. Um, another thing that's appearing as well, which I know mean, some folks are kind of quite gleeful about, which is going to be interesting, but there are certain scripting languages which are being put to pasture, and we've been full world of them. So this is the only bit that I actually have in notes. The rest of it is basically we are on slide two. Um, and the rest of it's all just, all just animations and stuff, which is why James, who's disappeared, he hates doing presentations with me because, well, there's only four slides. Yeah, there's 100 animations. Love the animations. Um, so, um, yeah, it makes it very awkward when there's two of you trying to do a thing. But um, the type of thing that, that Apple had advised over Catalina, or before getting into this, was that scripting language, language runtimes, such as Python, Ruby, and Perl, are included in macOS for compatibility with legacy software. Future versions of macOS won't include scripting languages by default, will require you to install these additional packages. Um, and also, there's another footnote around some of this when because it was announced around from Apple saying that use of Python 2.7 is recommended, this version is included in macOS for compatibility with legacy software. Future versions of macOS won't include Python 2.7. Instead, it's recommended that you run Python 3 from within terminal. If you're, if you're a Monkey admin, if you're someone who's using Monkey, Monkey itself, there's a recent release, 3.7, it's an experimental release. Please use and test that, but it bundles its own life. If you're using Jamjar, we are looking to that, and we are looking to, 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 to reuse the Python 3 as a bit of a Monkey, because it's a, it's a framework that works with Monkey, so it makes sense just to use that. But, you know, don't get caught short on this. This is something that's going to happen, so have a look at this, and have a look at, like, amending what you do from here. Um, the terminal has changed from bash to uh, zsh, which uh, uh, Mike mentioned earlier. Um, but generally, you can run bash, which can run other things as well. Um, other than this, I think I've missed the slide. That's fine. Um, if you look at the point, kernel extensions, those type of prompts, and the rest of it are still going to happen. But now you might need to restart. We go from kernel extensions to system extensions. So you go from kexts to sex. <laughs> <laughs> Bearing in mind the, the ridicule I've had from saying pig lists for like 15 times in front of people, or APNS, I need to kind of step away from that. <laughs> 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 
Um, and the macOS and iOS have a different uplift on TLS as well. But we're still, I think we're still, and correct me if I'm wrong here, we're still waiting on the document where Apple says prepare for this compatibility and actually list all these with the uh, Active Directory versions and all that. Yeah, we do have that same picture. Okay, so very short, very short kind of highlight kind of things to be worried about, or like hurdles. Obviously, we'll need to dare and test what we do. Other things that I couldn't find really nice slides for in the hour I spent earlier today. Um, to bear in mind of it's things like uh, uh, what's, been, what's been found recently as well is the Adobe packages, deploying the Adobe Creative Cloud apps, 2018 and 2019. There's a thing around notice relation which they are like, definitely tackling. There's also another thing around the API that they use to install applications, which won't, will not work if your user's not on deep. Or is it a screensaver and stuff? Which there's two companies with A at the beginning of their name. And one company changed it, and one company uses the API. And at some point, one company broke the other person's stuff. And one of those two companies that are doing value need to fix this. Because us as developers are impacted. But it might be, there, there were some reports in the Adobe forum, or the Adobe channel on Mac and Slack. It might be fixed now with 1015, supplemental, zero, no, anybody who knows? There was something about that. Yeah. But there is like a back end thing. So if you deploy in 2018 on Catalina, double check logging window stuff, no user logged in. Uh, if you're deploying 2019, again, double check. You might find that 2019 works, but you might need new installers. You might need to regenerate the, the InDesign, whatever installer you have, not working for three months. Whatever, might need to regenerate for. for, for not everything 64 bit yet. And not everything 64 bit yet. Uh, Adobe have got a blog post about stuff that isn't, and it's generally if you're running. The 2019, you should be okay. But the the 32 bit thing is probably, as, as Rich kind of related there, is probably going to catch people unawares. I mean, it's not as if we haven't known about it. It's been a couple of years now. We've had we probably had a couple of profiles to not nag people, but maybe we shouldn't have had those profiles. Maybe we should have just let an eggs happen so we could get the software updated. So um, if you're going to be updating, I say I will check those type of things. But things just might completely fail. Um, one thing that, that, as an example, that might catch people unaware is um, the old uh, Windows 2019 volume license packages. There's two versions of it. One's 32 bit, one's 64 bit. If you've had a 2019 volume license package thing from the yeah, office, yeah, from the volume license portal, and you've had it since 2019, was a thing, Windows 2019 isn't a thing. Um, it's not confusing, sorry. But if you've, if, if you've grabbed that since like they got, you probably need to grab that now uh, because that was so too big before. <coughs> Just trying to warn you folks that there's there's things appearing here. And there's a lot of good stuff, um, but there is enough to, 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 to have some caution. And the idea was here was, I mean, it's been more a week, week and a half since Kaling has been released. Um, for you folks to discuss and say anything that you found and why have you? I mean, how many folks, well, hands up there quick. Uh, how many folks are actually using Catalina in their environment, like the point it en masse? So, three. Not deploying, just all else. Okay, so you're dealing with folks as often. Okay. Um, but that's probably what? Less than 10% of the folks in the room, I'd say. And for which, for how many OSs have there been recently where you have such a low adoption rate, so close? That's pretty damn, really. Um, I mean, a few folks out there, what, what have you found? Why are you not, maybe? Next. Neil? Uh, you can't just print the drivers, and you know, this is so, so, okay. so Neil, Neil mentioned that cups print drives are going to go soon. Drive package, 4, 10, the old so the older versions are cups print drivers yeah. and now they need uh, IVP uh, drivers. In IVP, right? Uh, LPD. LPD. See, this is why cups are room. Um, then, yeah, there's a change in that print format. So again, another low level thing that you might not expect to break. Double check that. Do a search for IPP everywhere. Because that's where it's going. Yeah, everywhere. Yeah. So this is IPP everywhere, which is saying is basically where it's going, where there's a bit, a bit like a standard now. 
Um, if I could Google the XKCD and put it up on the stage, it'd be great. Yeah. You know where it's like, there's 12 standards, they're all wrong. There are 13 standards. Um, but hopefully this is actually a unifying standard. So, you know, printers, can you check them? As an MSP, you know, as a managed service provider, we've got lots of folks in over 100 environments. I can't, I, I, I reckon we probably deploy over five, 600 printers to folks. Probably using the LPI, which is going to be getting so yeah, probably using LPI, I'm just going to be that right? So this, this is the front end. Um, this is the, these type of things that you need to kind of put a stop on, just to make sure that it's good. Um, and it's not going to block on the new Shiny. Everyone's already got dark mode, so it's cool. Uh, <laughs> generally, hopefully. Um, but this is, you know, this, this is how, you know. <laughs> so there isn't a character mistake, is there, really? Dark mode, there's, there's, there's nothing that really engages folks, is there, to, to, to have it, so it's kind of cool. Um, is there, oh, actually, is there new emojis? Oh, new emojis. That's the, that's the candy. Um, but is, is there anything else? Up, like Adobe, printers, obviously your security agents. Side, what's it? Um, Sidecar? Sidecar. So Sidecar so is where you can use certain iPad models as a second screen. So if you're that fancy an Apple like fan, um, this, is, this is a person. I don't even have a team chip on my Mac. I, I have an iPad mini. Um, that's my kind of, like, I mean, forget what I've got in my pocket, my XS Max, which is, yeah, that's fine, forget that. Um, on my day to day workstations, I don't have anything that can run sidecar. Did we use sidecar? I had a second screen? No, buggy is how? Right. So we haven't had any issues. And we use it for, like, when we have live broadcasts, or we're trialing it for that. So you're just trialing it for live broadcasts, is there any issues? You have any issues? I'm not it, it, it works fine. Well, it works fine for 15 minutes. It works fine for about 15 minutes, and then you look over, you expect Slack to upload a few messages by this point, and nothing. And then it turns out you actually have to read the new iPad to come back <laughs> to the <life. laughs> and, and, and I think the other thing here as well is making sure that your MDM vendors and stuff support the full features. Um, <clears throat> the new user enrollment process, the BYOD thing, isn't supported fully everywhere. The bootstrap tokens. Anybody looked at an MDM or found a product that supports bootstrap, bootstrap tokens fully yet? No? Um, I kind of avoided them until now, and now I realize we should just avoid them generally. Um, <laughs> but it's a whole other world for secure tokens, because we obviously needed another way for secure tokens to make it more complicated. Um, but that's a whole other thing that's coming, and it depends on your vendor, it depends on how that's going to work. And again, the user enrollment, ground names, up IDs, etc., BYOD, all that type of thing. There's a lot of stuff coming, but I think, I think generally from the room, I would assume then that everybody's been caught short by Apple doing the Friday GM in one seed. I think in IT, in, in, in the episode of Friday, it was, it was GM, developer, it was Bayer 11, and then Monday, there you go. That was, I think that's, I mean, is that the feel from the room? Is that the thing we've all been caught short? And we are. Well, version jumps in between as well. Well, version jumps in between. And also, I think the newest kind of thing we need to realise as well is there's a supplemental update that's come out of Catalina as well. But it's not 10.15.1. Don't call it 10.15.1. It's now 1.8.8.G03 or whatever. Yeah, you can register now. But if you look at the development scenes and the FIT scenes, they generally follow a build thing as well. So we might stop talking about Apple OS as in point releases. And look at it as build numbers, which it obviously just falls off time. It's great that we know that G is H and A and B and Yeah. Okay. Um, this is this is more than enough of me rambling just trying to fill up space. Yep, I know I'm doing the dance, so everybody loves it. Um, anybody else? Anything else? So I can sort of Neil. Hey, Neil, hello. Who uses Repsado here? Neil's asking about who uses Repsado. Oh yes. Okay, so Repsado and NASA, so this gives you two things about this. Well, custom software catalogs, so custom software catalogs, and they're deprecated in Catalina. If you try a uh, SAT catalog URL, we were using software update, it says it's now deprecated. Now, if, if the camera wasn't on, uh, and I didn't know people from Apple, I would probably say that this is going to be deprecated quicker than Login Hooks would. Because Login Hooks have been deprecated for eight years or so. <laughs> I've been potentially advised that this might be deprecated like much sooner. 
software updates say we've got deprecating on 10.12? Yes, the, well, software updates say we've got deprecating on 10.12, but they're setting the custom sorts kind of URL. From all of Apple's ways of looking at kind of security policies and the rest of it, pointing to some random server to pull down software to make changes to the OS. It kind of fits with the model, right? It's not, you know, it, but your policies might not work towards that, but that kind of makes sense. The other thing as well that Neil mentioned, and I think uh, Hannes uh, is laying, and I'll probably horribly mispronounce his name, i really sorry for that. Um, and other folks have seen is that the, a lot of the um, uh, install macOS app packages expire 24th of October. Yeah. Yeah. So if you've got these older install apps that you want to kind of carry on running for the older install processes, probably read out right now. Um, if you've got a rip design box or whatever, that 500 gig isn't going to be enough, that 750 gig might not be enough, that one terabyte might be what you need for now. Because Apple have reissued a load of stuff because they recertify the most. Or you just find another, I don't know, it's your choice. <laughs> Neil, anything else? Nothing. Okay, anybody, anybody in here? I've got a big thing. Okay. Can you remove the reboot requirement for kernel extension for either GM? Okay, so, the, so I, think I, mentioned, I think I mentioned the fact that if you deploy kernel extension, you need a reboot, right? Yeah. And the fact that we've gone through 11 papers, there's only like two weeks for it, right? And then on Friday, this thing happens. And then on Monday, the GM gets released, which is kind of the same. Yeah, okay. Oh, oh you see, boy. We've all had a lovely time. No, I'm just saying, it's for the cleaners when they come in and tell you. Okay. Hold on. I'll get to go to the pub. Okay, that's, uh, that, 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 that's a good point. Um, anyway, they've removed the reboot as of the GM. But the first 11 betas and whenever there was still a requirement. And then so, the Friday, it was a requirement, and Monday, there isn't. So that's the thing. So, Nobody has to say anything because we have to go. There's one more thing, as in the one more thing, which is uh, Neil, come here. Right, okay. So, um, <coughs> come Monday, this poor gentleman is going to be joining my team of Deja. Sorry! <laughs> Obviously, I'm extremely lucky and thankful for this. Um, Speak to him Tuesday, he might not be. Um, <laughs> but it does raise the point of three of the five of us that run London Apple Admins, or Cat Herd, as we call it, now work for Deja. Myself, Darren, and Neil, as of Monday, and for next job, uh, Steve, uh, and, and Graham. No. So if there is any red flags, any worries that you folks have, please reach out to us, or Steve, or Graham, or Slack, or whatever. It shouldn't change any of this. Um, but I just want to put it forward because you folks have been amazing. I don't want anybody to feel uncomfortable because of this change of stuff. And um, please don't tell him any horrible stories between now and Monday because it's <laughs> like, done now. It's too late now. And that's it. We need to go because Ross says so.